soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force. You are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. Hi, it's Matt. Today we're going to take a look at the Waco CG-4A glider. About 14,000 were made during World War II, where it was involved in several operations, but it's perhaps most famously known for being used as part of the early phase of the D-Day invasion. The Waco CG-4A could hold about 13 troopers, or a pack howitzer, or small vehicles such as the Jeep that's aboard this one. Notice the manufacturer name is pronounced Waco and not Waco, which I had been mistakenly doing for years. The same is true for the Willis Jeep on board. For years I had mistakenly pronounced it as Willys. I guess you're never too old to learn something new, huh? The glider was constructed out of welded metal tubing, plywood, and canvas. There was no armor or armaments. The glider's best defense was its quietness. There are a few of these gliders left today because they were considered highly expendable at the time, but you can still see some today. I'll put links in the description below so you can see the museums where you can find these today, plus the sources I used for parts of this video. The Waco gliders were mainly towed by Douglas C-47s, which were the workhorses of the U.S. Army Air Corps. Although the gliders were mostly abandoned in place, there was a system to snatch up gliders on the run by lowering a tail hook and grabbing them up out of the field. This was a fun one. This has got to be the widest, longest Lego model I've ever put together. I won't quite tell you how long it is because I'd like to play a new game. It's called Guess the Scale. And this idea has come to me from Montgomery Animations, who is a recent subscriber and viewer. And he had asked me some questions about the scale of a couple of the models I'd built in the past. And it got me thinking, you know, I didn't really know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure the wingspan the length of the fuselage and the width of the cabin and from those I'm going to find an average scale but what I'd like y'all to do is to post in the comments what your guess as to what the scale of this model is so is it like 1 to 10 1 to 80 1 to 72 1 to 3967 you get the idea post it up and uh, the first person to get the scale the closest, I'll put up at the top of the comments. Now, Montgomery, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disqualify you because um, I think you already know the scale. But you're getting the shout out here. Thanks for posting your guesses and any other comments you want to write down. Anyway, let's get down to the unbuild. I'm just going to take off this wing all in one shot. First I'm going to detach the spars underneath. It's gotten a little bit bowed just from the weight of the wing itself, but it actually is all on one plane. It's supposed to be and flat. Looking at the top, you can see I approximated the four square window that's in the top of it. Oops, looks like I lost a hubcap. The construction of the tail 
was the trickiest. How to taper it, how to make these paint stripes work and work their way around was really tricky. Let me back up a second. Let's take a look at the underneath of the wing. So I actually made the stripes go all the way through and around. The distinctive white and black striping was used only on D-Day. There were actually only 52 gliders each assigned to the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions on D-Day and all had markings similar to these. Of course, as demonstrated before, this whole piece lifts up. Okay, I'm gonna scoot the, the body of the plane forward. I'm gonna take off this tail section. And the, the, uh, the tail essentially hooks up right here and here. It's underneath these two pieces, but laying on top of the back of the fuselage. All right. And there's the uh, tail dragger wheel. Here's what that looks like underneath. I'm going to take the struts off the side first. And these basically, I use these uh, ball and socket joints to be able to position and attach underneath the wing and this gives me almost limitless angle I can do that at. Okay, something I want to point out is there's actually nothing underneath the tail. My model does not have a floor under the tail because I was trying to reduce weight. Turns out my instincts were right. Because there was no floor in the tail of the real thing and nothing was stowed there for the same reasons. It would just be too heavy and throw the center of gravity off. Okay, so these pieces right here, these help to stitch the body together. What's nice about these is these can sort of go at whatever angle you need them to. I'm gonna pop those off. You can see that wants to let go. Okay, now I'm gonna pull this panel off. Here's what that looks like. This training film shows how they would load the Jeep up into the front of the CG-4A. They used special boards that could stow inside the Jeep um, and they were used to lift up the back of the plane to tip it forward. Unloading the Jeep was ingeniously simple. A cable with a pulley system and special clip hooked to the back of the Jeep. And when the Jeep pulled forward, the cable would pull the front cargo door up and out of the way. And then the cable automatically detached itself. This was also seen as a safety feature because um, in, ca in case the load shifted upon a hard landing, the pilot would not be crushed, but instead would be lifted up and out of the way. Okay, I've moved the wing and stuff out of the way so we can just get a better view of the fuselage. Let's take a look inside here. This whole piece is a hinge. It's not a hinge piece. I just made it into a hinge. So that's how the two uh, sides of the tail can come together. to look at while we're in here. One of my generous donors sent these funky sort of cross member parts in there, which is cool because it approximates the, um, 
these welded um, triangulated tubing that this thing was made out of. These are the bases to turntables, and I used them to approximate the porthole windows that are in the sides of these. There's actually four on the real ones, and this would be a door. Um, but uh, I figured that would be, that was just being a little bit too adventurous for me to be that super detailed. You get the, you get the idea. So, I'm gonna pop one of these sides off. And there's a good cross section of the inside of the tail. The landing gear is falling apart. Here's my landing gear. It's a little flimsy. These pieces actually come apart. Um, I probably have the right piece somewhere. That's that's a basically a dowel pin that would be better to use there. The wheels are old school um, expert Lego expert wheels underneath this old radar dish. Pull this away. So you check that out. That actually came on a tractor set I got in around 1979. And it was the coolest thing ever. It was the first time gears and these type of parts came out and I was just blown away. That's looking inside the back of it. take this other landing gear off it doesn't it doesn't match I couldn't find enough of the matching parts but you get the idea underneath we have skids the real uh, the real ones had skids underneath here either two or three and actually there would be smaller skids back here but again get the idea Okay, with the cockpit, you can see the, the steering wheels and the seats are built into the front of the cockpit. I use these traditional hinge pieces to make the hinge, the hinges. This is Lego tubing that was also in a donor box. And these exact pieces are the same pieces I use as the fenders for my M25 Dragon Wagon. So you can check that out. That's another funky World War II vehicle. Anyway, the seats, seats are mounted with the floor. On the real one, Behind the seats were ramps that would come down for the Jeep or whatever vehicle you wanted to put in there. Here's another look inside. Take these roof panel pieces off. sort of a cutaway view of the side. Okay, that's as far down as I'm gonna take that side. Let's take a look at the cockpit. And that's the view of the pilot coming in. Uh, even though they had two wheels, they typically only had one pilot. And actually there's sort of an A piece that goes here. Um, 
I just decided not to bother with it. I didn't want to clutter it up too much, but um, that's something you can certainly do. The wheels, I mean, the um, chairs are just on pedestals. These are curved pieces. I got whoa! I got lucky and found one big one after I'd already started. The dash is mounted here and here. There's a um, a long black piece. I forget what you call them. That runs through there. Here's what the ceiling of the cabin looks like. And you can see these curved pieces. I'm holding them in check with these pieces that are typically used to mount wheels. Okay, now with all the side panels pulled off, you can see this is one of these funky pieces. I don't think I'd ever used one before, and so I was really happy to use that on this model. Here's a look at the bottom, the cabin, and another look at the inside. All right, the wing. These are actually a couple angled patio pieces that I inherited somewhere down the line. I'll go ahead and break this sucker in two. So here you see a cross section of the wing at the center spar where it attaches. And here's the trick here. Since I only had those two center pieces, I had to find a way to kind of give the wing the proper angle, foil angle. And so what I did was I built a shelf essentially and just laid it at an angle and just barely set it on there. So you can see you can get that nice wing shape. To make it strong or stronger, I did a lot of layering and sandwiching. And there are, if I were to strip all the tops of the wings off, you would see that there are long, long pieces, longer than that, that are running and, and sort of overlapping each other to add longitudinal strength. So the thicker the wing, the stronger, but it also weighs more. So everything is a trade-off, and these are the things you need to think about when you're building a model and the stresses that go on it. The spars under the wings, believe it or not, actually, I think they worked to help support the, support the wing. Here's the wing tips. If I would have had more of these curved pieces, I would have used them, but that's all I had. Um, I was really scrounging. Well, there's another one for the books. Thanks a lot for watching, and uh, please subscribe if you haven't already, and I appreciate likes and comments and sharing. This one had some special meaning because my neighbor across the street was actually a glider man on D-Day. I never knew that till after he passed away, and I always regretted not being able to talk to him about it. Our elders are a wonderful resource for learning our history. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full 